All right, hello everyone, and welcome back to Excellent 3, the show where we talk about the plays and players from Excellent C Mid and Heavy League. If you have seen our thumbnail this week, and perhaps our uh, screen or overlay, whatever you'd like <laughs> to call it, uh, you might have figured out that we're not exactly Excellent 3 this week. We are Excellent 2. I am slowly consolidating my power, and I have temporarily taken over for Zephyr. <laughs> uh, he has something to do. I'm not entirely sure what it yeah. is, but... It's mysterious. Um, you know, Zephyr does mysteriously come and go from our lives sometimes. You just have to learn <laughs> to accept it. Um... That being said, you have little me to cover all of Heavy League this week, so I hope you're prepared. I hope you're ready for me just crying over um, the upset that was Anarchy losing. <laughs> if I had known that Zephyr was still going to be dead and gone, I would have followed up on a Heavy a little bit because Mid League was insane this week so i have to imagine heavy was also quite insane um but i uh i did see that yes anarchy lost to yeah. the good old boomers they really did you know heavy really was a sight to behold this week we truly opened up our playoffs bracket with a bang so first of all um i do want to talk about the match that was streamed on the main excellent three or er, excellent three <laughs> yes everything is excellent three now the main excellency twitch channel which was lotus versus booyah now this now it was a 2-0 but it mm -hmm. was an extraordinarily entertaining 2-0 this i don't know if I'm overselling this because I was just in the mood to watch a League of Legends when I watched it, but oh my goodness, was this a very entertaining show. And this wasn't just because Lotus performed well, although boy, did they. Um, but here you have Booyah really not giving up any inch that they do not fight for. Uh, you see Booyah playing in a way that is reasonably calculated. Uh, while I have some questions about the drafts that they tried to pull off, in-game, they were not inting their butts off. I want this to be clear. Booyah really did play a very measured game where when they were behind, which was a lot, they did not engage carelessly. They did not take any decision on the rift lightly. And I think it was the seriousness, the cool-headedness, and the even-handedness with which Booyah faced both of these games, which enabled these games to be so riveting. So first of all, the first game was nutty. It was now, Doctor, I don't know if you've seen these games. But I'm looking at this draft and the draft was an interesting time, wasn't it? This um, is interesting. Yeah, I mean, we have Akali versus Twisted Fate. We have Kane Jungle, which I finally saw for the first time today on the new season. Uh Zach Jungle, which I don't think that should work. Oh, <laughs> it, oh, um <laughs> I mean... it did. But really, it, it shouldn't. I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. I um have more concerns about the Kane jungle than the Zach jungle. Now, Kane is massively popular right now. Um, yeah. People are playing him left and right, both Shadow Assassin and Ross. Of course, this is competitive play, so it would be a truly wild time to ever see Ross or not Ross, to see Shadow Assassin pulled out when you have Ross available because yeah. Ross, I mean, Shadow Assassin is truly for solo queue. Oh, um, definitely. It, it's fun to play and fun to play as. Definitely not fun to play against. Nope, definitely not the enjoyable cane that we all know and love. But 
there's just too many tanks now in competitive for Shadow Assassin to work. So yeah, you're pretty much mitigated or relegated, excuse me, to Rost. Right. Which it, it's always been that way. And you know, I do think that is problem number one here. While Kane is very strong in solo queue right now, and that has to do with him experiencing an insane amount of healing. Um, yeah. In competitive, you do have to understand that you are giving up a lot of resources and a lot of flexibility to try to pick up that cane. So even when cane is very strong, it is questionable to want to pick him a lot of the time. Now, I say that cane was also pulled out in the other series, but again, that series didn't go too well for the team that tried to pick him either. So um, I yeah. do truly recognize the impulse to try to pick Kane competitively right now because he's just sufficiently strong to warrant consideration. But it's tough to draft around those constraints. Um, you know, yeah. first of all, well, it doesn't feel that way in solo queue when a really good king player has that champion on hand. Kane is rough to jungle with early on. It yeah. is if you don't happen to be blessed early with some sort of easy kill that really no one should have given you you're going to be irrelevant for a shockingly long time, given that you yeah. are a jungler. Now, and it, it's it's just so difficult because he's, before he evolves, he's just like half a champion. Like he has all the same abilities, but they don't have, you know, their, their buffs essentially. Um, and then if you, you know, gank the wrong lane, because it, like, so if you have a really good lane that goes in your favor, like looking at this game, like, say you want to gank the silas a lot because silas is insane once they get ahead and you know right. the kingslayer and everything else just works out so well you're ganking that lane it just so happens that you're into malphite right imagine if they'd lane swapped and or not even lane swapped, just like picked a ranged top laner um but you need silas ahead so you gank him to get him ahead you've now cornered yourself in a shadow assassin because you've spent so much time ganking this ranged opponent um and that's not necessarily always the right call. And so if you get to that shadow assassin evolution and decide not to go there, it's like, I think it's two and a half minutes before you can choose the other one. Like it's some insanely long time that you just like are it, useless. It is practically damning to get the wrong form on Kane. And you are touching upon something very relevant here, which is the fact that Kane is constrained to the lanes that he can gank. Now, remember, we were just talking about, wow, why would you ever play Shadow Assassin in competitive? That is never going to be allowed. And what that also means is that another thing isn't going to be allowed, ganking the bot lane. Now. Lotus was prepared to have a self-sufficient, safe bot lane at the beginning of this draft. They drafted for themselves Thresh and Ezreal. That mm -hmm. is what I would like to call a set it and forget it bot lane. That is you telling yourself that, you know what, if you don't want to have the time to go and visit bot lane, it doesn't matter. You have drafted yourself a safe, safe, safe bot lane that can just exist, absorb some pressure if it must, um, and, you know, just do its thing. Now, rightly so. The casters gave JVL a lot of credit um, in these games. And spoiler I mean, I alert, that, that so. cred I was just about to bring up the pentacle. <laughs> spoiler alert, there was a pentacle. I do think, uh, um, I do think JVL gets like a quadra kill also in that game. Um, Ezreal absolutely Insane. does. Alistar gets a quadra kill in addition to Akali cleaning up a beautiful fight with a penta. But aside from that, um, you know, 
here Lotus is um, first picking themselves an Akali. They decide, JVL, we love you. And we wish to be able to spend resources on you. So yeah. they say, bot lane, we love you too, but in a more distant manner. Um, <laughs> it's the second child. Now, that being said, when Booyah goes out and picks Kane, to some extent, this makes a little sense on the never being able to gank bot lane side, because after all, this is Thresh Ezreal. That's hard to gank anyhow, right? Yeah. But I do think that Booyah might have underestimated here exactly what they told these specific players when they showed a Kane who had to go Rost. Because suddenly you have Lotus's bot lane knowing for a fact that they don't have to care about yeah, a jungler farm. coming bot lane. Which yeah, means, farm it out. well, that's the thing, right? You look at these drafts, and I don't think we've mentioned the full draft at this point yet, so I'm just going to recount that for a moment. So Lotus has the Akali Thresh Ezreal we've talked about. They have Malphite and Sap. On Booyah's side, they've picked up a Kaisa Leona bot lane, the Kane jungle, of course, Silas in the top lane, and Twisted Fate in the mid lane. Now, when you look the at... The Leona pick is just Econs, so bad. See, I respect the Leona pick. Um, you're going to see... I mean, let's be honest. This is competitive League of Legends. You're always going to see a fair run of Leona. Um, but Leona is excessively strong right now. So I do understand trying to go for Leona, but I absolutely agree with you insofar as Booyah's drafts do look sus. And I think that absolutely contributed to their fate this series. Um, but you look on the side of Lotus and they've kind of given themselves a gorgeous dream team. Um, Doctor, I know you were a little concerned about the Zack pick here, right? But when you look yeah. at that in context of the whole team, I see a gorgeous classic front to back team fight comp that Lotus knows they can pull off well. This is kind of Lotus's thing. Sometimes I really wonder what it's like to be in comms with Lotus as they play, because I think something that they have shown us time and time again, particularly lately, is that their strength is knowing what they can do at any moment and coordinating that almost flawlessly. I don't understand <laughs> exactly how they do it because um, one of the things you'll see, particularly in game one, is a lot of beautiful TP plays, right? Um, Lotus is a team that never gets themselves into a bind without knowing who they can have come clean up without timing that very well for them. Um, you know, JVL gets ahead on Akali initially off of these TP kills. Um, I think it's the first kill that he gets where his teammates have done a fair amount of the work for him. <laughs> and he TPs back to lane and says mine. Um, hey, whatever. He's on a collie. He needs it. Got to get ahead. Got to, right. you know, build damage and be relevant. And, it, you know, as the first pick, too, like, you definitely need to be force-feeding kills to that champion because you, you invested so heavily in it with that blue side first. Absolutely. You know, that first pick of collie is a sign. That is a clear, uh, blatant message that Lotus is throwing out there where they say, all right, we have decided that JVL is carrying this game um, with an asterisk of also we have Ezreal backup damage. Now, um, there's there was another beautiful double kill that JVL got by TPing in for the top lane uh, somewhat early, which really and truly cemented JVL's massive lead in this game. Um, Notably, I think it would have been a triple kill. Um, and then Alistair snipes with an Ezreal ulti. 
uh, from the bot lane, which is kind of comical because he throws the ulti when the fight is decided. The fight's basically over. That ulti was a kill seal <laughs> ulti and nothing else. But that being said, you know, I say kill seal somewhat jokingly here because when you look at the gold advantage throughout this game. For a lot of this game, the gold advantage is not nutty. Um, while Lotus feels in control for so much of this game, it's less that they have a lot of extra money and more that they have the money on exactly the right people, right? Does Zack need money? Gosh, no. Does Malphite need money? No, he is a walking ultimate. Yeah. Thresh is Thresh, and they have loaded all of their kills onto Akali at first, and then slowly power creeping up Ezreal as their backup damage, and that's all they need. And gee, you thought Akali used to power spike hard? New items are all about power spiking with your first mythic, the first thing you build, you just go for the biggest power spike that you can possibly imagine. And on a champion like Akali that is all about snowballing a lead, that is devastating. When you're behind against an Akali who's looking that clean, who's looking that strong, the game's pretty much decided. Even if the yeah. gold graph didn't reflect that for a while, it's a, it's a pretty tough composition to play against, and I do think Booyah had a team to do it. I, I do question the Leona pick, although it was uh, Red Side's second pick, so they only saw the Akali up to that point. So I, I'm going to chalk it up to Lotus adapting to that pick much better than it is a mistake by Booyah to pick it. Um, but, I mean, the rest of the draft just comes out so nicely because you know you see Buya show their bottom lane of the Kaisa Leona. You can then pick your bot lane as Lotus so you get the free farm counter because they didn't ban anything away. You know, Buya on this patch as the red side team are forced to ban away tanks like right. basically so they have to go maokai orn amumu although i'm gonna be honest with you amumu has fallen off so hard um and you know we they actually picked one of his harder counters although gets outscaled in the cane and i'm gonna be honest i i don't understand why teams don't pick sidwani like it is it's been like nine months now and i i just cannot understand why teams don't pick Sidwani. And if the viewers here have a reason as to why teams don't pick Sidwani, at me on Twitter, at the doctors in two ends. It, it's just so mind blowing to me. She brings everything these other junglers do and is incredibly tanky for it and just gets so much more. If you pair her with a melee on anywhere else on the team, you have just almost unlimited crowd control. Like, that's why I say don't pick Zach. Like he's just so hard to execute and it, she's perfect in the meta too. Like I swear to God, I just don't understand it. And when we look ahead to this game too, I'm looking at the draft again. It It's seemingly more normal. You know, we get a trundle, which should, trundle should be really good. I'm going to trundle. should be amazing right now with how many tanks are getting picked up and Lotus respond again, perfectly. But just not picking a tank after that. No, <laughs> like, I'm going to be perfectly honest. I am a lot more suspicious of that Trundle pick than you seem to be. You know, you're out here saying like, oh, Trundle makes so much sense because, wow, tanks. Um, and I am used to a paradigm in which you do not pick Trundle until you see the tanks. Yeah, but that's, a, that's the only issue is they picked them second round. Like they, he's their second pick, so the only thing they see up to that point is Leona, who can really kind of bait you. Like if you have, right. if you're forced to alter before the uh, eclipse is up, then you lose out on a ton of stats. And again, this is a pick from Buya that is solid. It's a good pick in the right situation. And Lotus just instantly pivot. They're like, oh, they have a trundle. Just don't pick a tank so their tankiest member after that is the mordekaiser and it's shockingly mordekaiser is not a tank so lotus have some really good drafting here in this series and it, it makes me excited because 
teams in draft a lot right <laughs> and this is this is just great and you know, they adapted their gameplay it is really it is shockingly hard to not in draft you know it's really easy to look on someone's draft and say what on earth are you doing um and obviously you know from an observer perspective you have nothing to do but sit back and criticize the draft um but when it comes to picking a draft especially in this meta where again like i i don't feel like i understand what's going on and honestly when i look at the competitive meta that's forming i honestly don't think anyone else really feels like they get it either so i do feel some kinship there but Especially, yeah, I mean, like, it's when tough you don't too, know what like, to do, it's like, what are we going to do? I, I, It is a testament to how beautiful Lotus's first draft was and how well they pulled it yeah. off that you see in second game draft, Booyah says, oh my god, we cannot deal with any of this. They ban the Akali. They ban the Ezreal. They ban... What did they ban? I think they banned uh, Zach too, right? Yeah, it was yeah. Zach Israel Akali first rotation. That's which, like, insane. It, it definitely shows them that they didn't have an answer to those champions, or at least they didn't feel like they had an answer to them. Um, and like, I honestly don't think Booyah's draft game two is that bad. You know, they they get the Jin first pick. If you've seen Axeman, I saw him earlier in Twitch chat, and he was like, "Oh, they picked Jin. It's you know, GG go next." And it's true to an extent. Jin's pretty nutty right now. And then they see a tank, so they're like, you know what? Let's just pick Trundle and, you know, be aware of that. And then they get Orn, amazing top laner, solos anybody, incredibly strong. Right. Um, and so, like, at this point, it's up to Lotus to not troll. And I think a lot of teams at this point would be so hyper focused on what they want to pick and not necessarily pick around the opposing team. And so we would have definitely seen the Mordekaiser has a pick here, but just because it's the Orn counter, but then maybe we would see a tank jungler or um, something like that. But because Lotus have already picked their support as a tank, they don't need to pick a tank top laner because it, they, they get the Mordekaiser counter. It's up to them just to pick a different jungler. And I'm, it's very interesting to pick Lilia, I think, because I feel like she's taken a bit of a hit in the jungle now without having jungle items. So I, it, it, you know, spoiler obviously worked because they too owed, but it, it's, I, I'm going to have to go back and watch this game because the Lilia pick is, is very curious to me. And I mean, they got the, the echo counter into Victor. So right. that's just, that's GG go next right there. Right. You know, that being said, I do think that this is a game where Lotus struggled to execute a little bit more. Um, it certainly felt like they were less comfortable playing this kind of game. And the casters on deck um, actually mentioned, they shouted out some stats that I don't remember and didn't write down, <laughs> um, that Lotus does not typically do well on red side. Um, and I think that has to do with the fact that I think... Um, you know, there are two things going on there, right? One, Lotus does tend to stand their first pick. And two, Lotus likes the fortified position of blue side, where you saw in game one, Lotus had a team fight comp that would scale into a gorgeous team fight comp, basically mm -hmm. no matter what happened in the early game. And with that insurance, they stomped. In yeah. game two, they had less insurance, especially since they were up into an Orn who can again upgrade mythic items, which is particularly strong. And that's a little more concerning. Right? Not that they don't have scaling, but certainly they have pressure to win and they should win, right? They have put themselves in a position to win, absolutely. But yeah. if they don't win, they're going to be in a bit more trouble later than their previous draft would have put them in. And I think mentally they really like the security of scaling and also. As I said earlier, they thrive 
with truly classic front to back team fight comps and the team fight of the composition they picked don't get me wrong it's still pretty gosh darn good team fight but it's less of that truly classic team fight composition with various certain rules right where you have you know in game one you have thresh for hooks peel um thresh and zach and malphite for all of that peel and engage and then you just have damage maneuverability on a Kali and safety sustained DPS on Ezreal. And yeah. um, now I say safety sustained DPS on Ezreal to some extent on a Kali as well, of course. Um, but I do think that a pretty significant aspect of a Kali's team fight identity is basically drawing aggro with the insane maneuverability that she has so that in and of itself is a kind of peel even though it's primarily self peel um it does have this pretty strong distraction value um that and echo can do something similar um it's obviously not the exact same because it doesn't have shroud right. But, you know, he does have a lot of mobility. He can right. split push very effectively. His ultimate makes him very annoying to deal with sometimes. Um, plus, it, it does just a billion damage once you start right. stacking up items. So I, I do like that they're keeping GVL on a similar position, giving him the full counter pick this time. Whereas game one, they just kind of hung him out to dry and Booyah wasn't able to right. truly, you know... Uh, take advantage of it so they, they're setting up jvl once again to win uh Truly. which i think is smart um because you've already shown that your bot lane can play weak side your top lane it's top lane who cares um and you have a you know reasonably strong jungler in the the uh alawi not alawi lilia uh um, <laughs> how yeah. is alawi anything like lilia there's a lot of l's i don't know <laughs> but yeah i i think the draft here is perfectly set up for jvl because that's your carry that's your you know distraction team fighter and you know they make it work right they really do um that being said i do think for a while they're pretty uncomfortable on it they feel uncomfortable definitely looks like a little more hesitant to pull the trigger because it is less of the style of team fight they're used to but at some point they more or less um decide to win the game and it's when they decide such a lower kill game too it is um it, it really is you don't have that early dominance which feels a little strange because again they did give jvl the full-on counter pick um and in game one they had no reason or need to win early and they simply did and i really think that has a lot to do with both the kinds of champions they are and the mental game, right? I, I really do think they feel a lot more comfortable on drafts that look like game one. Um, and it's actually funny you, too, because I've been fast forwarding through the VOD and stuff. Mm-hmm. And so you have Twitch chat that pops up on videos and Paul, the, the caster for the series, even in Twitch chat goes, yeah, 9k gold lead and no action. Weird. Right. <laughs> so like like it, it's clearly something that multiple people have noticed that this red side slowdown happens to Lotus and could potentially be, you know, a pretty serious weakness. Right. And mind you next week, they have to see if they can take down CGC. And I would love to see it. You know, if anyone can take down CGC, it's them. That being said, I don't know if it's going to happen. I would love to see it happen. Um, I think especially game one of quarterfinals this week did Didn't give us something of a proof of concept. What was that? Didn't they get 2 owed? Uh... I don't remember CGC? when they played. No, Lotus. Or... Like when they played CGC last, didn't oh, Lotus oh, get yeah. to it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. But everyone does. It's CGC. <laughs> I mean. So they actually haven't played since. Oh, they... no, yeah, that's just what I thought. They played the final week before playoffs. So it's not even like this was like week one and they got 2 0 This is like a recent 2 0. Right. 
And, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't really inspire doesn't confidence well. at yeah, all. Doesn't bode well. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, again, you know, I want to see it. I want to see something that looks like that game one. Um, not that I have any sort of antagonism towards CGC, right? But when you see a team that, you know, it's you, fun to watch them lose. You you just want to see someone be able to stand up to them. Where is the David to our Goliath? Um, and you know, if I'm being realistic, I can't say I think it's going to happen. This split, this series, this bracket. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've said pretty similar things about our mid league bracket. Um, I, I actually said it on broadcast. I don't think anybody is going to be Glaive Black, and we did our dark horse predictions, and you know, we had people picking Drift or you know one of the Catalyst squads, and or like with Dag Scarlet, and I'm just like, they, they all got absolutely smoked by Glaive Black, and so like it, it's Frost or nothing. And Frost is literally the second place team in the league. And it's like, how is your dark horse second place? <laughs> yeah, you know, while this is the state of our tournaments, I must say, I'm really hoping to see uh, some evolution in this kind of competition next split i think we can i think, I think next split's gonna be insane i think like i yeah. believe and i hope and i desire to see next split lotus having just hardcore boot camped cgc destruction incorporated <laughs> you know i so, want to see them develop something um to crush cgc with and the interesting thing is i do think CGC and Lotus do have somewhat similar team identities. So I think the play for Lotus is really just going to be learn how to beat CGC at their own game. I think best case scenario for the leagues as a whole is you promote CGC to um, whatever may be above heavy, if there is anything above heavy, um, if there becomes anything above heavy, Jake, spoilers. Um, if that happens, if obviously nothing happens and Heavy stays the highest league, yes, yeah, CGC does need to take, you know, be taken down a peg. But I think if you have the room in the, you know, talent budget to get a league above Heavy going, definitely just promote CGC up. Like they've right. they've smoked they've smoked them two times, like two seasons in a row. Like they've shown that they're just unstoppable. They need some more competition. Right. It's only fair to the players and the league itself to, right. to make sure that not every week is a two Oh. And so you send them up, you take glaive black, send them up for the same reasons. And even if you just replace those one teams, like if literally everybody else across the board comes back for both leagues and you just move those two teams up one, it's an it's an incredibly bracket. Like it's close, it's competitive. You're not having two O's across the board every week. Like it looks amazing. And I think that regardless if that happens or not, I think season well next season it's season two for mid because this is our first season. But I think it's season three for heavy. Um, I think they're both shaping up to be insane. I, I think the teams have shown that they're willing to grow. They're willing to put in the effort, and it could just be absolutely bonkers to see the level ups that happen in the next month or so. Right. You know, I do want to see Lotus try to beat CGC again, but. I yeah, do week. think CGC <laughs> has something of a moral obligation to move up to uncapped if and when available. Um, from an organization perspective, suddenly it's going to be much less sure of a bet that they get oodles of prize money because <laughs> they get to crawl into heavy league here and just dominate. And you know, that is a really nice, safe bet, but... But I uh, think when we have teams like 100 Thieves and Cloud9 and things like that starting to break away from just LCS Academy and start bringing in amateur squads and you get the opportunity to play against them, I think that's incredibly worth it. Right. And I forget where I was talking or listening to it. I think it was 
in regards to um, Valorant uh, tournaments in that teams aren't always going into it for the prize money. They're going into it to play the likes of TSM, to play the likes of, you know, 100 Thieves, who are both, I think, at the time of this recording in game four of their first strike NA grand finals. Like, the teams want to play these better teams, and I think prize money's cool. Right. But prestige is more. Absolutely, Doctor. And, you know, here's where I I really do think uh, CGC will ultimately make the decision to step up a tier when they have the opportunity. Because, uh, and, and this is really just sort of believing in the spirit of amateur scene, where, you know... On one hand, it's nice to get kind of dollar signs in the eyes and say, wow, you know, we're going to get some pretty easy tournament winnings uh, this split because we're doing this thing that we dominate at. But at the end of the day, for amateur scene orgs, prize money winnings is not, wow, cool payday for us. Because mind you, the amount of hours that people put <laughs> into this yeah. absolutely do not yield anything resembling even minimum wage um, as a when content you creator your yeah, prize pools. you know at the end of the day this is about the love of the game the love of competition the spirit of both competitiveness and the desire for self-improvement that really drives our motivations at the core and prize money at the end of the day is just what enables you to play in more tournaments listen it's not about securing the prize money it's about securing the salary bag that's Ah, what it is and so you can't get to that salary bag until you rank up in the competition until you say hey i can beat 100 thieves next yeah if you're just bullying you know platinums and stuff like that like you're not getting salary money come on guys now that (laughs) means stop (laughs) stop the bullying yes anti-bullying campaign please secure the bag then bully come on that's how it has to be. Um, you know, <laughs> I I really I want to see CGC struggle. I think they have and and yes, I do want to see them struggle just because they've been so dominant, but also from a perspective of truly wanting to see them improve, I mm-hmm. want to see them faced against a true challenge. I no one has truly been able to challenge them. And it's a little sad to say and to see, um, but I I really think it's true this split. Um, That being said, gosh, I just, I do want to see Lotus to have some more time to refine themselves into a form that can actually challenge challenge cgc but i don't know if we're gonna see that anytime soon i don't know if that's what we're gonna see next season at all um because yeah it, it's, it's the tough. event that you know we're looking at mid heavy uncapped well lotus should stay in heavy right i think in the event that cgc moves up a tier next split becomes Lotus's time to shine. I really think they're going to be able to dominate um, in a way that won't exactly be CGC, but will look something vaguely reminiscent of the kind of dominance we see out of CGC. And I want to see that for them, and I want to see them practicing just the pure consistency of domination and possibly work on the red side (laughs) yeah the red side the red side nerf can be a little daunting to come over um and you know if it's a drafting issue then you know you need to sit down as a team and talk that out if it's like a play issue then there's something more uh subconscious about that difference and you know maybe it's locked camera drift maybe they all play on locked camera and they just can't play red side i don't think that's it but hey you never know sometimes um but i think if you know 
right now they're heading into CGC in the semifinals. That's this week, this Thursday. Um, as long as they don't have any uh, scheduling changes like we do down in mid. Oh no! Uh, oh so no! The, so if CGC, you know, if they they come in as dominant as they have looked, I, I think it's a scary bracket from then on out. Um, you know, the other half of our semifinal, it's going to be Wild Boomers versus Blad Banners because the Boomers came out over Anarchy. Right. I don't know if that's actually intended or not, if that's a feature or it's a bug, but, you know, Boomer's just sticking it out, surviving another day, I guess. You know, I really do, and I hate to say this, I can't help but believe that while Boomer's pulling the win over Anarchy Fallen Paladins has a lot more to do with Anarchy than it does Boomer's. I think that Anarchy's just had a bad run of it where they conceptually had a team with a clear identity and a good plan, and then it kind of fell apart via the jungle, and they've tried mm. to repair it, and it just hasn't happened yet. You know, I I do think that the misfortunes that have plagued their roster um, have really dominated their legacy this split. Which is unfortunate. It, it's really unfortunate because, you know, sometimes you see glimmers of what Anarchy can do. I think they have a distinct team identity that, when it's allowed to flourish, pulls out some pretty interesting things um, and plays interestingly. Uh, I think, oh gosh, I don't remember what week it was, but... I remember them playing against CGC and getting their butts kicked seriously <laughs> because they said to themselves, okay, no one can beat CGC just playing the way we play every week. We need to build a strategy against CGC specifically. And they tried something that they thought had a decent shot they had my understanding is they had a specific anti-cgc strategy that they weren't yet comfortable pulling out mm -hmm. in full yeah. but anarchy is a team that likes to experiment and that's really Which, fun to see yeah i mean experimentation to a degree is always good to see um you know if, as long as we're not seeing like nami ap mid for experimentation purposes, like you can play around with a lot of things and, you know, experiment, especially preseason. Like this is the time to get those kinks out to make sure that, you know, you're actually locking down a game plan and teams that are more open to the experimentation, as long as they've rein it in, will be successful in the long run. Um, you know, when you look to players like Voy Boy, right? Like who else was playing Tristana mid when it was a thing like it it's you know obviously he didn't actually do anything because he just <laughs> anyway <laughs> it's better for the long run of the organization if you can get you know a s coaching staff around a series of players willing to adapt and willing to change um it'll be better in the long run because it, right. it breeds this culture of trying to make something work you don't just ram your head into the wall of why doesn't my gen 80 carry win me games it's hey gin's not working let's try um you know uh brand bottom brand's not working let's try zig's bottom it's the same thing but different let's try you know ash bottom varus bottom whatever it is and it it doesn't limit you which is which is overall better and you know anarchy really isn't afraid to pull out the strategies that they feel suit them. And I really think that's going to be an exciting asset to see once they nail down some of these more fundamental problems within their team play and their roster. And, you know, it just didn't happen this season. Again, they were kind of caught treading water um, for an unfortunate portion of the split. Uh, I don't think there's a ton of fault there. Yeah. I do think they are going to have to spend their time off really trying to nail that down before they can come in and start improving on the things that the other teams will be practicing uh, during their break. Uh, yeah. You know, just to pull an example, 
from what we saw this week alone, it's that um, not that Janna isn't a, you know, a sufficient Leona counter, ca- counter in vague quotes. Now, this causes you pain. <laughs> um, you know, the Janna doesn't do bad in these games, you know? While I would say that Janna isn't necessarily the greatest pick that you can choose in a competitive Anything. environment. <laughs> really ever. It's just it's it's very limited. Janna is a very solo Q pick, I must say. But the fact that they understand that hey, when we have to lane against a Leona, this is what we perform well on and this is what we're comfortable on, yeah. I think is an admirable impulse. And I think it's indicative of what I would like to see more of from Anarchy in the future, where they're not afraid to pull out their strats. And one day, their strat is going to work beautifully and brilliantly. Yeah. All and the I just want come them together. To- I just want them to get to that stage. And they have some fundamental pieces to find, to dig out of the bottom of a drawer (laughs) somewhere before that's going to happen. Get to digging anarchy. That being said, um, you know, there was so much to cover. And I think there will continually be a lot to cover as we really zoom into the play throughout these playoffs brackets. But we spent enough time on heavy league. If you haven't seen the heavy league games, just go to the Excellency Esports channel, watch the VOD of quarterfinals, Lotus versus Booyah. You won't regret it. You know what's going to happen. You won't regret it. It is truly entertaining. Um, Again, congratulations to Lotus who looked fantastic. Wow, Pentakill on JVL, Quadra Kills on Alistar. Um, you see their shining players shine. Um, just a shout out here. I mean, we're I'm talking about the carries, but Dunsey on that Thresh? Oh my goodness. Now, there are players who are willing to play Thresh, and there are players who want to play Thresh. Dunsey is someone who wants to play Thresh. And Love to see it. When, when it goes well, for example when they have an Ezreal and Thresh and no jungler to worry about ever ganking their lane, they pull off insane 2v2s. And that has a lot to do with Dunsey. Even if, you know, the score lines and the damage charts um, highlight Alistar and JVL. That, um, that being said, Lotus, thank you for, uh, I, I hate to say it, but I will preemptively say thank you for going out with a bang. Rest in peace <laughs> next week as you do your best to take one game off of CGC. Yeah, we, just make it a non, you know, non-lossless season for the best of it, right? Why not? You know, just, just take one game off of CGC. We will sing your praises. Um, otherwise, <laughs> thank you for joining us this split. Um, True. Please come back and dominate next split. Um, you really are poised to do so. That's going to be exciting. Um, similarly, uh, we bid my loves at Anarchy farewell. Um, Yo, have fun against VBO next week. Um, I can't say that's going to necessarily look great for you, but hey, you know, you do have a shot. Um, yeah, I mean, you've I'm already hoping, come this far. I am hoping to see a competitive series on that side. Uh, that being said, I've now spent, I think, almost 50 minutes on Heavy League. Um, Doctor, this was going to be a shorter episode, by the way, guys. Doctor, but, please nope. take over. Uh, you so, know, so you one, said my was very, crazy. my very last thing about Heavy League is that if you're interested in the commentary side of things, uh, shout us to Chilling Walk. Actually, did a um, casting vod review for that series as well. I think it's still up on their Twitch channel. Um, so I believe that's just twitch.tv slash chilling walk with W O K for those of you spelling illiterates out there. Um, I think it's also just chilling, no G. I, I yeah, could be no, wrong, I was but... about to say, like, I would be more concerned about the chilling spelling than I would the walk spelling. Yeah, I mean, somebody will put a C in walk, you, know, you never know. It rhymes with, you know, t- 
talk and balk and I mean, I suppose they might think they meant W A L K walk, but I hear the name Chilling Walk and that immediately yeah. sounds like W O K to me. Yeah, so if you if you're interested in commentary, check them out. I haven't had the time yet myself, but Jake uh who does a lot for everybody says it's really good so i'll take his word for it and i'm gonna check it out at my next convenience but yeah huge shout outs to them more content around the amateur scene is always good you love to see it thank you for doing that thank you for helping the scene and uh mid-league time whole boy was last week crazy we had goliath esports versus drift esports and granted Everybody except Loud Thoughts said that Drift was going to win. But man, did they win. Holy hell, did they win. They, it was 2-1. I called for a 2 so I'll take 50% credit. Okay. But the game that they won was just absolutely insane. If you have nothing else, no other care about keeping up with mid-league, watch game three. Just by itself. It is so crazy the comeback that Drift are able to pull off off of their Cray bottom lane of Kitten and Dog. It, it's just insane. Like the they had an any mid, which inted. So we're like, all right, game's over. Toast. Call it. <laughs> like that's it. And then Cray Kitten just wins. Like they're on vein. It's just insane the amount of plays that they get to make happen. And they're playing into a Samira as well. Like the draft that Goliath lose with is nuts. It's uh Maokai Graves Echo Samira Nautilus. Like it's one of the scariest drafts ever. And you they <laughs> Drift picks Vane into that. What? I'm yeah. sorry what and it wasn't even like it was it wasn't even like it was um first rotation vein and they all got counterpicked. It was let me pull this back up. I'm pretty sure it was fifth pick vein. Interesting. Sorry, fourth mean, fourth pick. Okay. Fourth pick on red side. Wait, wait, hold on. Nope, that's not pro draft. Hold on. You're like, mm, that's a lie. I'm I'm pretty sure. So, uh, man, I was completely wrong. It is actually the vein pick into Samira. So it, they mm-hmm. first picked it red side. So the draft went Samira, first pick blue, then vein Leona. And then they got the Nautilus, the Maokai, the Echo, and the Graves. And so I know Valley and Mac Dewey on the analyst desk were like, it's a bad pick. Don't pick vein. And then, right. you know, Loud Thoughts and I come in and we're like, it's a bad pick. Don't pick vein. And they, they just smurfed. Like they go O2 and lane. They wait till 30, 40 minutes into the game. They win some insane team fight at their last final inhibitor. They've already lost two and it's just comeback season. Like it's so crazy after that. And I, I really cannot put it into words. Just how insane this comeback was like you just have to witness it loud thoughts was losing his mind i was losing my mind i'm sure the players were losing their mind like it's nuts i mean okay imagine being the samira who didn't manage to push a lead over a vein i don't i mean i have a lot of questions here doctor i mean <laughs> question one is why is mid league letting Samira through a draft phase. That's question one. So the Samira, interesting enough, was supposed to be a handshake um, because every game they were getting something good for Goliath. Like our first draft here, they first rotation, they first pick blue side, they get misfortune. Uh, they binge gin themselves and they pick misfortune. So they're already starting on off on a good foot with, you know, these early game lethality style marksmen. They're, you know, they're feeling good about it. Game two draft comes by Goliath are now on red side. And so they pick Samira off of the handshake because what we're seeing from Drift is they ban away the misfortune that dumpstered them game one. And so what does Goliath online do? They don't ban Jin or Samira. So it's a handshake. Jin for Samira. You think it should go well because Samira does have all that scaling. She just brings so much to the table. She's backed up by a Leona and an mm-hmm. Orn. Like you just you just think Samira's the pick. It doesn't work out for them. Drift take game two. So you're like, all right, you know, it's what it is. Game three comes out and we see. Let me pull up the, the, the draft again. Um 
again, Goliath Online, they're back to blue side. They ban away the Jin and Drift don't ban Samira. And thankfully, I was able to interview them after this. And their take on it was, we thought the Samira was bad. Like, we didn't think game two, they played it very well. It didn't seem very scary, like you typically think of the pick. So we just said, heck it, give it to him again. And it it's crazy that they first picked the vein on red side to counter it. But they came in with a game plan, and they executed it. Right. Sort of. I mean, not, there not really. are... There are very few things more exciting in League of Legends, especially if, like me, you are very heavily invested into that bot lane life, where you see a Vayne come back and carry a game. There, oh, it's the best. I mean, Vayne is your quintessential, archetypical, hyper carry. You know, Vayne in solo queue itself is a terrifying moment where you get a vein and you think, oh no, can they tumble? And then you see a vein on the enemy team and you think, oh no, can they tumble? In competitive, vein becomes especially hard because everyone wants to lock down that vein. Um, yeah. Vein is a gamble, especially playing it into Samira. Are you kidding me? That's... So <laughs> What's even crazier, so we're at 27 minutes into the game. It's like the game deciding... Uh, yeah, it's like the game deciding team fight for Goliath online. Vayne doesn't have any kills. She's 0-2-2. Two two. They they break the inhibitor tower, and they're starting this team fight. And Samira, at this point, is 3-1-5. and five. And so it isn't until 27 and a half minutes that Vayne gets her very first kill of the game. And that team fight makes her 1-3-4. and four. But this was such a huge momentum shift for Drift. Now, keep in mind, do you remember the team comp I, I read to you? So it's Maokai, massive beefy tank. Right. Graves, tanky. Echo, assassin. Samira Nautilus, also tanky. At 27 minutes into the game, Goliath Online have also secured themselves the Earth Soul. So on top of everything else, they also have that bonus HP shield for free, forever. And somehow, the magic of Drift Esports, they win a team fight. <laughs> like, it is just insane. I still can't get over this. I, can't. I tweeted, I tweeted Friday morning or Saturday morning. I was like, still thinking about that Drift 2 win victory because it's just so insane. I don't understand mid league, Doctor. I really don't. I, I don't ask. Me. I don't ask for understanding. I just show up and say what's happening on screen. It's just insane. Oh, you love it, though. You love to see it. You know, that does make for exciting League of Legends. I just, gosh, do I have a lot of questions that I don't think will ever be answered. Yeah, I don't think watching it will answer those questions because we definitely were left with questions on the desk. Um, but I mean, they had Drift took a 2 1 over Goliath, which I believe was also the same as our um, our regular season bout. Uh, let's see, Drift. I wish I could like sort by teams on tournament. Gosh. That would make life easy. So I, Drift Glacial. That sounds right. That was like week three at most, right? Yeah, I think it was pretty early on. I think it was uh, like either week two or three. Drift. Yeah. No, that's Glaive. Uh, Drift. That's not it. I don't know. Tournament, please be better. All right. Well, as you're looking for that, <laughs> I'd like to shout Week out. Week four. Oh, okay. Week four. Okay. That's a bit later than I thought it was. And it was 2 1 in favor of Goliath. So interesting enough. Right. Okay. And Drift, Drift squeaked into playoffs too. You they, know, um... Drift is a team that definitely feels very scrappy, but mm -hmm. they're definitely the kind of team that you want to root for because oh, definitely. when they pull something off, it's brilliant. And I think this week's games were a perfect example of that. Yeah. I mean, they beat, you know, the four seed as the five seed. So 
you know, it's a bit of an underdog story. They they have to play Glaive Black now. So, so they're not sorry, winning. guys. So they're sorry, not guys. Winning. So we basically have another Lotus CGC situation, kind of where it's like, wow, good job this week. See sorry, you guys. next split. <laughs> Yeah, and it's kind of unfortunate too because the other half of our bracket is Catalyst Frost versus Catalyst Blaze for the semis because uh, Blaze was able to take it over um, Dag Scarlet, which s- mathematically is a bit confusing because Scarlet was third seed versus Blaze's sixth seed. Um, but Blaze, I believe, were borrowing the ED carry from Frost, I oh, think. No. Wait, do we the- allow? I mean, obviously, we do <laughs> happen. The, I didn't I don't remember if it was, that. I don't remember if it was the AD carry of Frost going to Blaze or AD carry of Blaze going to Frost. One of the Catalyst teams had an issue where they couldn't use their normal AD carry and so borrowed it from the other Catalyst team. Okay, well, um, it's Blaze that played this week, so I'm going to assume... It, it might have been the last week of the season, too, because... Okay. Without us doing a show last week, my timelines are kind of messed up. Mm. So I think it was actually for the final week of the season. Because I remember we talked about it on Excellent 3. So yeah, it must have been that final week of the season. But I'm going to be honest. I I don't know if you saw in the discords, but the conversation of sister teams playing each other absolutely took over the conversation in the discords for a while. And it was like so divisive that some people are like, who cares? It's just, we're here for Good League of Legends. Right. Don't pay attention to the team names. If you care that much, just watch Good League of Legends. And there are some of us, myself included, that find sister teams boring once it comes to playoffs. Right. Because you, know, you did say that last show and Zephyr shares yeah. your opinion there. I can't share that opinion. I think it's inherently very funny and interesting to see sister teams play each other. Uh, I just, I, I think there's something inherent in the relationship between sister teams that makes it when they have to play against each other. Very interesting to see just from a storyline perspective. Yeah, I, for me, the storyline of sister teams just breaks down to organization wins. Yeah, you know, I, I think you and Zephyr <laughs> did say that last time, you know, like, congrats, Org gets a victory lap, but... But it's also like in like specifically for Frost and Blaze, Frost has shown to be significantly better oh, than yeah. Blaze. Oh yeah. So I it's don't... not even it's not even like, like we could be like, oh well the, the lower seed team is practicing all this much to be better than higher seed team because they're their own training partners. Right. <laughs> so like you can almost for like you can already know quote unquote who wins. Right. Uh obviously they have still to play the game, right? So, like, there is a world where Blaze right. just wins. Um, but I mean, there in... is a world where Blaze wins, but it is it is very important, I a think, small world. that Catalyst exists in the world where Frost takes the expected victory here. Because at the end of the day, we have to keep our eye on the prize, and the eye on the prize is the finals. And yeah. Catalyst Frost could win against Glaive Black in the finals. Catalyst Blaze cannot and will not. Yeah. And I mean, if you listen to certain players in the league, even the Frost matchup could be a bit of a stomp. Um, But, I mean, the Glaive players themselves did say that Frost was their closest competition in the season. They did 2-0 them. It was two weeks ago, though, so there is this week and then a little bit more practice, and it is new patch. And and let's be honest, mid-league is just the land of 2-0s. That's just how you guys yeah. function. There's something, <laughs> yeah. there's something about the momentum of winning game one that is just series deciding in mid-league. Yeah, which, I mean, makes sense in a certain sense. Um, you know, we did have the Blaze 2-0 of Scarlet in our quarterfinals, uh, whereas Drift... They, they reverse swept with the 2-1, which is nice to see. Um, so at least we got one series to go the distance. And it was the stream matchup, which is great as well. Um, and so, you know, our next match this week it is Glaive Black versus Drift Esports and then the Catalyst duos on that game as well. Um, and I, I mentioned earlier that we were going to have reschedulings, unfortunately. Um, and so for those of you who plan on tuning in on Tuesdays, I don't know why I held up the number two, but for those of you who hang out <laughs> Tuesdays, on Tuesdays, the second yeah. day of the week, the two 
TWO's day. Yeah. Oh, that's a good. Oh, all right. We need that on a graphic. For oh, next yeah, season. we do. Because, you know, you are the land of two O's. So, like, two is a big thing in mid league. Yeah. And you can meet us on Tuesday. Uh-huh. But not this week. Not this uh, week. Our Catalyst semifinals have been rescheduled to Friday, which is going to be December. 11th for those of you who are watching this in the future time um it is going to be catalyst blaze versus frost on friday the 11th uh and then the other matchup which is going to be glaive black versus drift esports is rescheduling to monday tomorrow at the time of recording which is december 7th um so some of you may not actually be even seeing this podcast until after that series happens sorry Subscribe to Patreon and you'll get it early. Um, Subscribe to Patreon and you can maybe see it in time. But you won't hear this message until after. So Unfortunate. GG next time. (laughs) You know, you snooze, you lose, I suppose. I guess. But yeah, so Glaive Drift is Monday at 9 p.m. EST. Um, It is still... These semis are still best of threes, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, Um, yeah. But yeah, so unfortunately not Tuesdays this week. Hopefully we'll be back on Tuesday for the Grand Finals, which I don't believe we're getting another break between. So that would be Tuesday, December uh, 15th, uh, if my math is correct. Uh, So that should be fun. I do have to imagine it is going to be Glaive versus Frost, though. Sorry to Blaze and Drift. But numbers don't lie, guys. And the numbers are certainly not in your favor. Listen, if there's one important skill in all of League of Legends, it is learning from the past. And if we have learned from the past at all over the course of this split, it's it's black and frost. It's not... Sorry. It's not that yeah, interesting, it, so- you know... <laughs> Blaze, just try try to fight the instinct to troll, knowing that you're losing to your better sister. Yeah, I mean, I mean, so I do want to kind of not preface this because we're at the end, but like end face this to the viewers and the listeners. We're not trying to be hurtful or derogatory to these lower seated teams in any sense of the word. We're, we're you know, we're not trying to make them feel bad or anything like that and you know i i know especially with like zephyr and myself sometimes it can come off pretty harsh the way we talk about some of these teams and some of these drafts and game states and things like that zephyr Um, is the impossible to please stepdad (laughs) yeah and it again we sound harsh and at least for myself i can't speak for zephyr even though i i would hope he has the same mindset we say the things we say because we want you to improve we want you to get better um and I mean, if you have complaints and you don't like the things we say, reach out to us. Like, we'll adapt, we'll overcome, we'll try and be better for the viewers and you know the players at home because this content is for you guys, right? Like, we don't come in here every week just to talk into the void. We want to, you know, bring informative content and fun content to you guys at home. And so, if, if something doesn't hit the right way and something falls flat we like to hear that because that means that we're doing something improper. I'm not going to say wrong because we're not always wrong. And now what's this <laughs> I hear doctor? Is this the sound of an angry mob swarming Zephyr's Twitter DMS? I think that's if he has DMS open, which if I was him, I probably wouldn't because actually I don't not. Sometimes I forget that Zephyr actually has a Twitter, to be honest. <laughs> I don't, I don't think he's very social. Uh, uh social understanding i don't think his you know his insta game's that large um you know a a sad (laughs) truth i do notice in professional league of legends like you'd be surprised at the names out there in just like you know the lcs realm where they'll just just have their dms open right like a lot of people do have dms open except women who work in esports uh for a reason for obvious reasons that I, I think betrays a very sad reality. Um, that being said, no my DMs might be open. Bad. Um, that's fine. Like, who's going to... If Honestly, if you're getting mad at me <laughs> over <laughs> Amateur League of Legends esports, I want to see that those harassment messages. I don't think they exist. Um, yeah. For me personally, if you send me a naughty DM, I'm straight up 
posting you on blast like oh my goodness now. yeah no screenshots <laughs> you know yeah i i once heard someone um say to me and this was the first time i heard of this phenomenon maybe i just was out of the loop um where someone said to me oh don't worry you know i respect the implied confidentiality of dms and i'm sitting here and i'm like implied confidentiality like i'm sorry if you didn't want something to be thrown back into your face why did you leave evidence of it exactly yeah (laughs) like 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 i i so i'm old and by old i mean i'm 27 um (laughs) so so like i yeah i'm pretty old um but so like i i grew up in the knowingness of the internet is forever and so don't post literally anything you want secret there and also the internet's fun let me post everything here so like i know enough to just if it's not good keep it to yourself because it's gonna get screenshotted it's gonna get posted and you lose all credibility to complain that you got screenshotted I don't care if it's in a DM. I don't care if right. it's in a fleet, a Snapchat, a story. None of it. If you it's put out it in there, writing. You, you hit su- send, my guy. You, you hit the send button. The evidence. Yeah. But again, don't DM mean things to us. <laughs> don't don't DM, DM mean, mean things, things to the players. To anyone in general, really, ever. Like, please yeah. be like a conscientious, respectful human being. Um, you know, we are in the league community, which is notorious for being toxic in solo queue chat. Um, and there is there is something about the anonymity of the internet that makes people feel emboldened to things that I think they know are morally wrong to say to people in real life and they think that because they type it over the internet they're like somehow less morally on the hook which is weird to me but you know be good people please let's all be good and wholesome together uh one of my favorite things about excellency as an org in general is i think it has a lot of positivity a lot of truly good delightful people (laughs) it's Um, crazy you know, it's just, I've had nothing but a blast working with Excellency on everything, uh, both in terms of people who work with and for Excellency, the organization yeah. itself, and the community that forms around it. I've had nothing but positive experiences on both sides. Um, I definitely have so, to agree. Um, you know, here we are with this long PSA about not internet bullying people, <laughs> but, um, you know, that's not something I expect from our community. And it's all Zephyr's fault, really. It's Zephyr's so. fault. You know, he's just a mean, mean, mean that you can young DM child. If, if you just DM him, it's your fault, Zephyr. Just if he gets that a hundred times by the next time he logs into Twitter, actually, don't do that. That could end poorly. Depending that, on that could end poorly. That really could end poorly. Just all right. Here's the thing, Zephyr. We don't know where you are, but if everybody viewing this on whatever platform you decide, just send him. The thumbs up emoji in the DMs. It's neutral. It's confusing. It's funny to me. So yeah, do that. If he has DMs open. If he doesn't have DM open, sorry, I tried. But to the players, Glaive Black, Drift, Catalysts combined, because there's a lot of you. Have fun this week. Play your best. It's for a grand final spot. So this is important you definitely want to be able to call yourself the first ever mid-league grand champion that's a huge title that you can get tattooed on yourself you can get it framed in your grandparents house you can put it on your gravestone and so you don't want to miss that opportunity all right well um that was quarterfinals uh we're going into semifinals uh continually exciting gameplay um excellency continues to put on nothing but quality shows we hope to see you tuning into the games live if not you can come see us next week and we'll talk all about it thank you so much for watching listening engaging with us uh we appreciate uh (laughs) we appreciate your eyeballs we appreciate your feedback um generally interacting with us uh so that being said Uh, We wish you the best uh, throughout this week going into the wintry 
frozen depths final of season. December. That is final season. Let's be honest, we're all students. Um, but both finals, <laughs> finals in terms of final exams and also in terms of the final round of matches of Excellency. Very exciting. That being said, uh, I'm your host this was a doctor with the mid league and kind of also heavy league because he's an mvp <laughs> analysis um it is time to log out peace